Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you guys very much for coming out to our panel today, Technology for a New Edge. My name is Sam Smith. I'm a Master of Business Analytics student here at MIT Sloan, as well as the panel lead for this panel. Uh, joining us on the panel today, uh, starting here, we have Terry Meyerson, uh, VP of Windows and Devices at Microsoft. CJ Anderson, running back for the Denver Broncos. Adir Schiffman, the chairman at Catapult. Uh, Chris Capuano, a uh, member of the Sloan Fellows Class of 2019 and former MLB pitcher. And our moderator today is Tom Taylor from Sports Illustrated. Our panel today is going to last about 40 minutes with about five minutes for Q&A. Uh, we welcome questions from you guys on Twitter. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask our panelists, please tweet them with the hashtag TechEdge. Uh, with that, I'll pass it over to Tom. Awesome. Thank you, Sam. Um, so my background, actually, before becoming a journalist, uh, I was an engineer. Um, so this is a subject that really interests me, sort of technology for new edge. Uh, technology for a new edge. How, does, how can we use technology to make sports in some way better? Um, and I think just to introduce the panel, I'd love to know just quickly, like, what are you up to right now? And what piece of technology do you see in sports right now that has been a real game changer? Let's start with Terry. <laughs> I'll go first. Uh, what piece of technology has most influenced sports? Yeah. You know, it's funny, I reflect on that question, and I think about the, when that yellow first downline <laughs> first showed up watching football. I mean, for me, that was the first time I think I experienced augmented reality. Uh, generally, you know, now we see augmented reality in so many applications and so many industries, but that yellow first start yard line was augmented reality. It was transformational, I think, for me as a fan. Now, of course, we're seeing the technology impact the player experience, coaching experience, fan experience, you know, while whether it be playing in their own game or, you know, playing FIFA in sports, playing Madden, or watching a game. So for me, augmented reality has just been uh, transformational. And then artificial intelligence is the other thing we're seeing. People using data to uh, create strategies or you know, create video games that recreate the experience. Awesome. CJ? Um, I don't see that first down line when I'm out on the field. <laughs> it definitely doesn't help it's me. Behind, it's behind. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we use the surfaces and the cattle poke. You know, it's funny that I get to sit between <laughs> both these guys. Uh, we actually use this, the surface on the sideline, looking at pictures and, and looking at um, actual live what happened, the play or the series before as an NFL football player. And fans don't get to experience that, but it helps us tremendously. It's like watching tape game film on who I'm playing against. So if I'm playing the Patriots, I get to see, you know, Bills or Matt Patricia defense right there, you know, now. Then the, the data from the catapult to make me a better football player, um, to let me know, you know, maybe I'm running too many yards just at practice. You know, I've had practices where I ran 8,000 yards just at practice alone. You know, is that too much on my body? And I think it helps us as an athlete in the recovery process, but that would be the, the two that stands out to me. It's hard to disagree with CJ, isn't it? <laughs> um, I think you know one of the things that's uh, that's that's coming that is not well known by fans in the US yet is what this wearable technology is going to bring to fans. And so we'll talk more. I guess we'll talk more about that. But um, that is just beginning around the world, and uh, it's been helping athletes for. You know, I was saying to CJ, it's been we, we developed this back in 2004, so it's been around for a while. It's been improving over. Quite a, quite a while. It's improved player welfare, improved tactical decision making, but there's a fan layer that is coming that I think is going to be quite transformational to the fan experience over the next couple of years. Yeah, so for me, uh, you know, I, I exited the game after the 2016 season, and I, I really didn't take advantage of a lot of the wearable technology like CJ is using now. I just saw it in the forefront, and they were asking you know, guys like me who had been in the major leagues for a long time, do you want to try this, do you want to try that? And, and uh, as an established player, sometimes you're very resistant to change, you know, doing things differently than you've always done it. Um, but one of the biggest transformational things I've seen is, is uh, and I'm, I might be kind of brown nosing because I'm about to be a Sloan Fellow like some of these guys, but um, uh, it's the data analytics uh, that has revolutionized the way that we prepare for games. Uh, we've always had scouting reports, we've always you know, ha had that information that we use to, uh, you know, select what pitches we're going to throw or how we're going to, uh, you know, form a strategy for a game. But um, the wealth of data that I saw from when I first entered the game in 2003 
and there was a few early adopters, like Kurt Schilling was a really early adopter who had this uh, whole bat system on his personal computer, and we're all looking at it saying, you know, what, what is this guy doing? You know, what is he looking at? And, um, and now it's absolutely, um, uh, you know, commonplace, and we have whole staffs on the team built around uh, analyzing, uh, you know, uh, thousands and thousands and millions of data samples um, to show us, you know, hot and cold zones, er areas of, um, you know, uh, where to throw our certain pitches. And now with pitch FX, we can actually see spin rates. We can optimize um, the way that we're actually performing those skills. So um, really, it's just the capacity to um, gather uh, and analyze this data that, that has been the biggest revolution in sports. Awesome. Um, kind of on that topic, and I've turned to a dear now, I mean, you're also a doctor, like a medical practitioner. Um, so a lot of this data is like, is it medical? Is it sports data? It's, it's hard to tell kind of where that line, line is drawn. And you were talking to me backstage about um, uh, a player in a, in, a, in a rugby league final, I think it was, and you showing like the heart rate data on TV. I, I wonder whether you could kind of like delve into that a little bit. Well, uh, so if whether or not it's health data, it depends on who's asking the question. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's HIPAA, which is a pretty big thing in the US, and you've got to comply with HIPAA if you've got health data. And some of the data is definitely health data, like heart rate would fall squarely into that category. You know, things like that we don't do, like bloods and, and those types of things, falls into that category. Other things like biomechanical movement and biomechanical profiles of players, that doesn't fall under HIPAA, so you don't need to comply on that, on that basis. You know, there was an interesting thing that happened in Australia that you referenced, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure this will happen anytime soon in the US, but it will, it will definitely happen. Um, so there was a game called Rugby League, which is uh, not a well-known game in the US, but a big game in some other parts of the world. And so it was a big game. It was like the second highest rating game on uh, Australian television that year across all, all shows. And there was a final kick, and the kick was for a couple of points, and it was going to determine the outcome of the game and you saw this player lining up for the kick. And what fans want to know and experience is the story behind what is actually going on to deepen their engagement in the moment. And so it's a pretty special moment when, uh, when someone has this opportunity and it's a big game like this. But what we were able to do is to take the heart rate data off that player in real time and show that on the screen as he was preparing for the kick. Did you get his permission Which, to do that? Uh, you know, the, Man, so, I was just going to you know, This is wonderful sitting between two very um, strong athletes on either side <laughs> for this conversation, so, so I feel very secure. Um, but uh, so his permission was sought contractually and indirectly because the legs work differently outside the US, frankly. Right. Um, but you know, what it showed was, was really deepened the experience. And what it was is that he'd been running a lot during the game, so his heart rate was elevated. Um, and generally, I have to say, people love knowing the heart rate of athletes. Athletes are, you know, they are elite. And so their heart rate, one is it's a lag indicator generally. Like, and the second is, you know, they're trying to hit high rates of heart rate when they exert because, you know, it's providing oxygenation to the body. And so, so this athlete was interesting. He was lining up for the kick and his heart rate was elevated from the previous exertion. It's like running 160. And then what you saw is that as he lined up to take the kick, his heart rate started falling and he had this incredible control and wow. poise as he took the kick and he made the kick. And the depth of the narrative around that moment was vastly more engaging for the fan because of that little stream of data. So, you know, I said in the US, you can see by, uh, by the reaction of these guys that it's not happening tomorrow. <laughs> but, but over time, um, as there's more acceptance of uh, bringing these narratives to fans, in, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge supporter and publicly a huge supporter of engaging athletes as part of everything that we do, all the way from the welfare information, and we were talking about how CJ finally gets access to his own data now, all the way through to that kind of thing. I think athletes need to be on the journey as well. Um, but the opportunity to create these deep fan experiences, it's here and it's available, and it's, I think it's coming pretty soon. Yeah. Chris and CJ, I mean, I'd be interested, what are your fears related to that? I mean, right having been in that experience as, as the athletes. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, for most players, most current, you know, uh, professional players uh, in the US, whether you're NFL or NHL or uh, baseball, I, I guess their fear is that ha how is this data gonna be used against me, right? I mean, if I, I could be someone who's, um, you know, 
maybe I just have a lot of anxiety. Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe I'm, but, but maybe I have the tools to cope with it. And, and I think, um, you know, biometrically, I think players are just worried that there's gonna be some bit of information that could possibly be used against them. But I think what, what the thing is, is that the millennials and the young players really appreciate um, that fan engagement piece, I think, more than some of the long established players do. And, you know, you see it on their social media and everything else. It's all about, you know, bringing the fan closer to the athlete and, and letting them engage with that experience. So, not only that, but in baseball specifically, um, you know, the Major League Baseball Players Union uh, represents Major League players. So, um, teams have this wealth of professionals in their minor league systems, about five times the amount of players that are in the big leagues. Um, that they can test a lot of this, uh, a lot of catapult, Zephyr, all kinds of biometric type testing. Um, and players can really start to see the benefits of uh, gathering and putting this data into use, as CJ was saying, in terms of the way they train more optimally, rehabbing from injury. Um, so it's not happening tomorrow, but I could definitely see in the next 10, 15, 20 years, you could, uh, you're certainly going to have much more technology in the game, and you might start to see things on the fan engagement piece, like, you know, pitcher batter matchup, the heart rate piece, and you know, how, how uh, you know, that athlete takes a breath and is able to lower his heart rate before he executes. And we don't have to start with heart rate. I mean, we could start with acceleration to first base after a hit, for example, or, right. or things well, like that. Well, they, they already kind of have that start. with stack cast. Yeah, you see, like, Yasiel Puig, they'll have, you know, will, uh, the right fielder for the Dodgers will cover, you know, 180 feet in four seconds, and, and they have all this amazing um, data with accelerometers and, and just cameras, mostly, stack cast is using now. So um, it, it truly is revolutionizing the, the, the experience. Like Chris said, um, our business is already cutthroat, so uh, <laughs> uh, that being used against us, yeah. I don't think that would be a problem. I think the biggest one we fear is uh, negotiations, you know. I mean, I've just seen Alex Smith have one of the best years of his career, and, you know, they traded him, you know, to Washington like nothing. You know, I'm, I'm one of those guys who have dead cap space, and I got a younger guy behind me, and they'll just get rid of me if, they, if the Broncos choose to do that this year. I think it's negotiations. I think it'll be more with, because like I was telling, I didn't get my data till this year, right? And I believe I was better because of the information that, you know, my coaches was holding from me. You know, I just had to go ask. My coaches was holding from me. I believe I had a better year this year <laughs> on the football field because of the data that, that I have. Now, if I walk into John Elway office and say, hey, LA, A, B, C, but he says, you know, X, Y, Z, I might not get paid as much as I would like or as much as I think I should be getting paid because he can use that data, you know, of the, the issues and the problems that I have. Mm -hmm. of, this is why I don't want to pay you or this is why I'm getting rid of you. This is why you're getting waived. You know, this is why you're getting traded. So I think that will be the fear um, in our business will be the negotiation side of things because it's already cutthroat as far as if, if they believe, I mean, Patrick Mahomes is much younger than Alex Smith, so they got rid of Alex Smith to start Patrick Mahomes. So that's just how our business is, and we understand that as players. We understand that when we, when we signed up to play in the National Football League, but I think when it comes to negotiations, you know, they can go, hey, Tom Brady, you know, you're, you're not good in X, Y, Z, so we're not going to give you X amount of dollars. You were, you were undrafted out of Cal, but, I mean, you're wearing your Super Bowl ring. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you're on, a, I think, a four-year, $80 million contract. I mean, you, you obviously probably should have been drafted. I mean, like, are we, can we use this data to make smarter decisions? Like, Tough. I don't, I don't know. Um, I would say, yeah, because I was, you know, I was drafted with a guy in front of me named Monte Ball who had 83 touchdowns at Wisconsin and, you know, all-time touchdown leader at, you know, at Wisconsin in, in the NCAA. And, you know, he was a second-round pick. I was undrafted. We both went to the Broncos, and then, boom, I'm, I'm here. And, you know, he's uh, taking care of his kids and his family, which is, you know, not bad either. I'm not no disrespect to Monte. That's my dude. That's my dude. But um, can, that, can the data that, that these coaches get, um, information that they get, make use better decisions? I believe so. Yeah. You know, um, you would think at some point during our NFL combine that is actually going on this week, um, you know, we're talking about VR, I believe if we can put VR and give game-like experiences to those college kids, because a lot of our college game, I think it's different from there, but our college game don't transfer over to the NFL today. So if we can give those game-like experiences to those kids right now who are um, 
going through the NFL combine and doing this one big job interview to, to you know, hopefully be in the National Football League, mm -hmm. if we can give them the virtual reality, you know, game-like experience, I think our coaches and, and GMs and owners can make better decisions on who to pick, who not to pick. Because, um, you know, I won't get into detail, but there's a difference between why I'm, you know, why I play with Peyton Manning and why Monte didn't. Everybody can, you know, guess on that. But there's a reason why that happened. And um, I think if we gave that game-like experience to our, to our, you know, young, you know, upcoming athletes, that's going to make our game, you know, what we believe is the best game today, I think that will help, you know, our GM, coaches, scouts, et cetera. I mean, if I was, uh, if I was recruiting at the Combine, one of the things I want to know about a uh, running back or a wide receiver is I want to know what their lateral acceleration is. Because that is one of the key determinants, especially of a wide receiver. You know, Jerry Rice was considered to have this crazy lateral acceleration. That was one of his hallmarks. And that is not measured at the combine. And actually, it's measured inside Catapult. You measure that every practice. Mm -hmm. You get to see a lateral acceleration. And so I think that as, uh, as it evolves further, they're the types of things you'll, that uh, you'll start seeing uh, will start appearing for, uh, for recruiters. Yeah, it's, it's, an, it's an inevitable, uh, it's coming. And I think the athletes will, the benefits of better training, better decision making on both the athlete's part and the business side of the game uh, are, gonna, are gonna far outweigh some of those concerns. Um, but you know, that's why we have our labor unions, that's why we, you know, to try to make sure that, um, especially from a HIPAA standpoint or any, any other concerns, um, you know, that at least some of that personal data is protected. Terry, from a, from a sort of technology giant point of view, like, is there something that Microsoft can bring to this like, understanding of this data? Well, I mean, the, a lot of the, it's interesting, the, some of what we're talking about here is data privacy, which is a challenge, mm -hmm. and uh, I think there's so much data we're all creating every day that's being recorded around us, about us, and this is just yet another, uh, you mentioned how video, video videos of us, which we don't own, can infer a lot of this data. Then we have things we're adding sensors to add more data. So data privacy is a super interesting challenge, uh, especially internationally. Some, some places, some countries of Europe in particular is much, has much more regulation beyond HIPAA around, around data. So the, you know, for us, uh, helping uh, us as individuals and helping the organizations to get the most, you know, both in the right way to protect the data, but get the most out of that data, analyze that data, visualize that data. Um, it's something, there's just tremendous breakthroughs going on in our, we call it artificial intelligence or deep learning or machine learning, all these is kind of the same thing. But I think it is gonna help uh, in some ways individuals and organizations you know, get more out of their, their goals, optimize their goals. Um, and then, you know, I think it's about prediction and simulating the future. I mean, that's really, you know, predicting what will happen next and, and uh, simulating, you know, what happens going, going forward. Um, is, is there a fear that it might push us the wrong way, that we'll, we'll, we'll be blind to the, you know, maximizing such and such statistic that now we lose a game? I'm sorry, what happened? Like, is, is, it, is there a fear that, like, we'll follow these predictive models too much <laughs> and that we might, not be making like the right actual like like football or baseball specific decisions because okay we're maximizing such and such like statistic but I mean there's all kinds of fears for this artificial intelligence <laughs> and you know <laughs> you know the but I think the you know I think there's a helping us all do our jobs better whether it's the athlete or helping the fan get more out of the experience I think that's the there's incredible it's important to be an optimist and see how it all this technology can be used for the better, and I think it will be. I think, too, uh, you know, any of you in the room who were lucky enough to hear President Obama speak yesterday, he talked about um, um, the need for vision and direction and that human component, um, right, doesn't go away. Um, it, it's like what you said, that AI and everything else can, can truly be an amazing tool for us to make decisions, but ultimately, at the end of the day, you need, uh, you know, a guiding vision, you need you need people to, uh, to, to be able to use that data and make decisions based on it. So, uh, so that component you know, isn't going away anytime soon. I think the, 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 the best example of that, um, it was back in 2006. Patriots was playing the Colts. Uh, it was on Sunday Night Football. Um, it was fourth and two. Bill Belichick decides to go for it on his side of the 
I guess you want to say 50, but it was really on his side of the 30. Um, I know for a fact, talking to a bunch of players who I'm, you know, really, really good friends with on New England, they use a lot of data like, hey, the, the coach defense, you know, we're, we're, we're 70% chance on fourth and five and under to get the first down. Right. Um, throws the ball to Kevin Falk, Kevin Falk is short, you know, and sometimes that data, you know, miscued and, and, and move you the wrong way because you forget you got somebody like Peyton Manning on the other side of the field who drove down and scored, and the Colts eventually won the game. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they went on to win the Super Bowl that year. But um, you don't want to jump into it, just like Chris was saying, you don't want to jump yeah. into it and grab on it too much because at the end of the day, really special players, you know, Peyton Manning, Tom Brady, LeBron James, you know, Kershaw, Bumgarner, really special players can stump data plenty of times. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we see that definitely. I mean, you know, you're a superstar athlete. You're on the way to being a superstar athlete. Like, you know, we can go and say, um, this is your frequency of repeat high intensity efforts and performance under anaerobic conditions. So that's an important metric because yeah. it's like, do you get up and can you pull yourself together? But actually, like, when you uh, engage with elite athletes, what you see is, like, there's this other characteristic they have, which is an ability to perform under circumstances where they shouldn't be able to perform, which you would probably call heart. Right. And... Uh, like you're talking, like, severe dehydration. Yeah, or, or just, you know, you know whatever. I, I pull out a performance that is the best performance of my career at the most important moment of my oh, yeah. career. Yeah. And so that is not on any data set. Um, but it is like a magical characteristic of high-performing elite athletes, and I think that um, it's a fool's errand to try and think that the answers to all of these questions lie inside the data, right. but certainly um, the answer to injury reduction and general overall performance improvement, and certainly the answer to how to prolong the career of an athlete, because that is something that is not spoken about, yeah. I think, enough in this country. Like, you know, there are athletes, and yes, the average, you know, the average tenure in the NFL is, a, is two to three years, but there are players that are gonna play on beyond that. And the question is, how do you prolong that career for as long as possible, reduce injuries, get them to peak at the right point in their career? And, you know, it's super helpful to have this kind of, uh, this kind of analytics to guide decision making. And uh, I would, you know, you, you, you mentioned that like the, the coach or whoever's negotiating the contract might use this data against you. Now, my two comments on that would be, one is, um, they, they know if they want to keep you or not. True. And so that's just negotiations. And like, you're just going to say A, B, C to them, or you know, you're just going to hide something else, or they're going to try and, you know. So like, these are just negotiating points. They're unlikely to shape the outcome of negotiations. The second thing I'd say is, like, hallelujah for the day that this level of data is used by that senior person in the organization to be making decisions. And I think, you know, that is one of the things that's changing as well. You know, I wish you were still playing ball and we could, you could see some of the stuff that's coming through because baseball, you know, we were late to really engage deeply with baseball. There's some algorithms, pitcher algorithms that took a while to build. But um, the sophistication of people higher and higher up the chain is increasing. And there's a comment I made, which was a throwaway line like two years ago, and it was controversial then, uh, maybe it's not controversial now, maybe it's a horrible comment to make again, but, um, <laughs> but I said, you know, there's gonna be um, two kinds of coaches in elite sport around the world. There's gonna be coaches that believe in this kind of analytics and engage with it, and there's gonna be former coaches. They're gonna be a two kinds of coaches. And so I think we're starting to see that happening. We're not there yet, but, but it definitely is happening. Yeah, awesome. Um, Chris, so you're, you know, you had a dozen year career in, the, in MLB. Um, but you're now switching to sort of, you're gonna be a Sloan Fellow right. this year. Um, most of us here have no experience of what it's like to pitch in Major League Baseball. Right. Um, and, and CJ kind of brought up the, the concept of like, sh being able to give college kids the experience of what it's like to be at that pro level. Right. Like how do we, are there ways to use technology for both college kids, but also us in general as fans to actually make us really engage with and understand what it's like to be, you know, standing on that mound that, like, in a crucial point of a game. Right. Yeah, well, that, I mean, that, that's where the, the virtual reality and, um, you know, I actually want to hear where you're at with, like, holograms and things like that. Um, but, because um, I remember, you know, when I used to, one of the things in baseball as a pitcher is you have a limited number of reps to practice, right? Because mm -hmm. Constantly in a, in a season of 162 games and 183 days, it's all about just trying to recover. You know, you feel good for the first month of the season, and then the last five months you're just trying to recover for the next performance. And um, you know, so I might, if I if I'm a starting pitcher and I'm pitching every five days, 
on the second or third day between those starts, I'm going to go down to the bullpen, I'm going to get on the mound, and I'm going to um, you know, throw a little side session. And I might, I might be thinking about the lineup that I'm going to face next time. And I might say, uh, you know, I'm going to be facing uh, David Ortiz or, or, or you know, uh, A-Rod, who was here yesterday, wh whoever I'm going to be facing. Um, and you might have, uh, you know, one of your coaches or the bullpen, you know, grab a fungo and stand in there and, and kind of pretend he's that guy. <laughs> so um, I'm really interested. I mean, you know, imagine if you could have, if like holograms got to the point where I could actually physically have, or, you know, physically, but actually have that person standing in the box. And now I'm trying to execute pitches to them. Um, you know, and by the time I get in the game now, I've literally already, you know, pitched to these, to these guys. Um, and you could, you know, when the technology gets better and cheaper, you know, you're out in the backyard with your 13 year old and you can, you know, have him pitch to whoever Mike Trout or whoever the best player in the game is. Um, so from a training standpoint, and then the virtuality, virtual reality component of, um, um, seeing the game, the games at the higher levels basically just get faster and, and, um, you know, um, as you get more and more comfortable, the game starts to slow down. And there's all types of training that hitters do in terms of training their eyes to track these, uh, like, tennis balls with little numbers written on them, right? And they'll throw them, like, 100 miles an hour, and they have to call out the number or call out the color. Um, so um, I just see virtual reality and things like that augmenting um, that repetition process, um, getting reps without putting the physical strain on your body. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's just gonna, it's just going to improve performance. And, oh, yeah, from the fan experience, too. Um, the, the other piece, too, is the NFL, you know, I, I'm blown away when I see these, um, you know, these 3D replays, you know, 360 replay type things where you can actually, like, you're Tom Brady and you're looking out and you can see the receivers doing what. And, you, um, and that, from what I understand, it takes such a tremendous amount of data to produce that. It takes minutes to kind of process, right? And, and as our processing power, you know, picks up, we're going to be able to get that stuff more and more instantaneously. And... Um, so from a fan perspective, I can just see, um, you know, the way we consume the game um, being ever more immersive and athlete-like. You know, um, you can, if you're an outfielder and a guy hits a ball in the gap, I mean, you can probably actually get to the point where you can see it from his point of view, what that looks like and, and how, how much ground he has to cover. So that was, that was good with our Thursday night footballs, even though we don't like them because our game's super physical. But... Um, that's what's good with us. We had the sky cam this year that showed the back angle from, you know, how a running back eyes when he sees the hole and, you know, the data from, from like he says, from point A to point B, you know, how quickly do I get to the hole and, you know, um, Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, um, you know, Russell Wilson, Aaron Rodgers, you know, where they're making the decisions and where they're putting the ball, you know, where their eyes is going when they drop back. So um, that's more uh, fan-like. Um, you know, it's tough for us to get that, you know, down to the to the college kids or 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 13 year olds or high school kids because our game is so physical. You know, there's going to be some left tackle, you know, up in here real soon in May, um, late April, early May, get drafted. Um, he's going to start for a team and he's going to run to a guy like Von Miller and Justin Houston and he's just just <laughs> there's no data to tell you you're ready for that at all. That's just that's just that's just the truth. You know, that's just the truth as a left tackle. You go, oh, man, that's Von Miller, and hey, yeah, he's one of the best pass rushers in the game. So right. um, our game is so physical, you know, it, it's tough. I guess what pitching is, you know, location will be great for them when it comes to teaching, you know, they can teach that location earlier to, to them. With us, it's all, you know, cerebral and mind, you know, seeing the game, trying to make the game slow down mm -hmm. um, as quickly as possible because the physical part of our game is always going to be there. You know, you mm -hmm. can't stop. None of those. I mean, we've had uh, in the past years, we've had data that that helped us, you know, pick certain helmets. I don't even know if fans understand that. Like we get a helmet scale every year of what helmet is better concussion prone to to other helmets. And, you know, us as players, you can pick I ain't gonna say the goofy looking helmet, but you can pick a goofy <laughs> looking helmet that helps you with, yeah. you know, it will lessen your chance of having concussions. But if that helmet's not comfortable on your yeah. head, you won't use it at all. And yeah. I think that's where some, you know, people miss, miss out on that too, so. Yeah, that, that's a great point with the actual physical products we're gonna be using too. I, I tried all these hats towards the end of my career, um, you know, for preventing uh, injury from the dreaded comebacker, you know, and it happened to me in college where I, you know, I let go of a pitch and, uh, um, you know, just turned my head and that, and that ball was just right there and, it, you know, rocketed off my head and, and um, you know, knocked me out basically. And um, you've seen some horrific, it doesn't happen often and nobody really, not, else, not like us. 
But still, <laughs> but, but, but the, the options are just so, like you said, goofy is the only word to describe it. You know, you get these big, so, um, so not only from a, you know, data uh, standpoint, but actual the physical products that we're going to be using are going to get, and think about all the sensors and stuff that can mm -hmm. be embedded in our clothing and our uniforms eventually too. Yeah. It's interesting because the, the HoloLens product we work on this creates the hologram that's been used in training in a number of places. We simulate the, you know, you know, what we add to your sight, add to what you hear. Yeah. But there is this next frontier that hasn't been crossed to simulate touching. You know, the mm -hmm. concept of having a glove yeah. where you could actually conceptually would feel that, a that's ball in your hand. That's like, not yeah. uh, commercially available yet. It's sort of, a, it's, it's just science at this point. But it's... Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna round up Deion Sanders. I can't it's, wait. It's, yeah, it's like, it's like those video games where, like, you know, you're you're actually feeling. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure we're gonna simulate uh, <laughs> direct well, not, kids not, anytime not soon. But uh, be a lawsuit. Yeah. But I mean, I do think you mentioned how are kids gonna experience this. I do think um, there is sort of stepping into the action of a play. But at some point, as all this data gets collected, I mean, I think there's this. We can call it video games today. But we are gonna be able to relive experiences or recreate these games, and it's all gonna be fed by data. So you'll be. Uh, that cult patriot game you mentioned, uh, you'll be able to step into that specific play and, you know, with all that data, be able to simulate a different decision. That yeah, and I think that help. I think that help. You know, our kids a lot. I mean, you look at why is this data not being used down to high school? I mean, you know, like you mentioned, myself, I was undrafted. I was also a three-star recruit. You know, there was J.J. Watt who was a three-star recruit, and J.J. Watt is one of the best players in our game today. And, you know, how does that happen? You know, and if we get, if we get some of that data at the high school level, you know, um, maybe, you know, some of those high school players who get overlooked, Antonio Browns, who's a seven round pick, but one of the best receivers in our game today, um, maybe they get, you know, he doesn't go to Central Michigan. Maybe he gets that data when he's young and, you know, that elevates his game a lot more, you know, that goes to an Alabama like Julio Jones or, you know, a Georgia like A.J. Green and, and and not to say earn, because we still have to earn our respect, but get the respect right away like those two did in the same right. class he's in. Well, we've started, um, we made a product called Player Tech, which um, US high schools are now using in their football programs, which is a much simpler product to use. It doesn't need a team of sports scientists to interpret the data. But um, you know, that's kind of, kind of helping with the, what you're talking about. I think you know, one, one point about um, smart textiles, as they're generally called in the industry, you know, there's a lot of very sexy stuff that is always just like two years away. And it's been two years away for 15 years. And so it might be two years away, it could be. Um, and one day it will be like two, two months away and it will happen. Yeah. But you run into these problems of physics. And so you know, no one really thinks about that. And one of the issues with smart textiles is you can embed sensors and do all sorts of fantastic stuff, but then you, how are you gonna power the thing? Because battery tech has not really advanced very much. Power is uh, it's pretty hopeless still, frankly. And, uh, and so you can do things like embed fibers that, um, that are uh, resistors effectively, and as they stretch, they change the resistance, and you can measure all sorts of things. But you've still got to power these things. And then if you want to use them more than once, hopefully, you've got to wash them. And so washing is not a great experience. And so the challenge is, if you're already going to put a battery pack on there, mm. then what are you really saving by embedding everything else into the textiles? Why don't you put it in the same? And so I think there's like a dose of reality that exists as well, which is like we, we live in a universe with laws of physics. And unfortunately, well, like when you write code, you can, if you want to fly, you just type it in and then you fly, right? It's like Minecraft. But if you want to fly in reality, like, you know, then that's a lot harder to do. Uh, there's laws of physics. And I think the same is true of a lot of hardware tech um, th that exists, frankly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Com comfort is, a, is a, big, a big deal, you know. Um, I was someone who didn't mind compression wear when I pitched, but there's a lot of um, uh, players and athletes who prefer more of a loose-fitting type thing. Um, so yeah, I know from an athlete's perspective, you know, um, it's got to be comfortable or they just won't wear it, you know? That's just so. the truth. Yeah, he's right about that. Um, it's like with the helmets, with the concussion. I mean, there's, there's really, really great concussion prone helmets out there. Um, you know, I have a helmet that's on that, on that good side. Um, I've only had one concussion in my career. I changed my helmet when I found out. And that wasn't introduced to me when I first played football or first got in the NFL. Um, I got a concussion, you know, my second year in the league during a preseason game. And, you know, um, our equipment guys told us, well, you know, CJ, your helmet is on the bottom end of the concussion total pole. And I was like, really? But it looks great. But it felt comfortable, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right, right. And you know, I went with a comfortable helmet on the other side. You know, comfort is huge. If it's not comfortable to us as athletes, then there's no point of the data at all. Because we're, like he said, you know, me being my sixth year in, 
you know, he played 17. You have, you know, guys who played 15, 12, 10 years. They've been doing the thing a certain way. They've been doing mm -hmm. things a certain way. So it's tough to get those guys to adapt over because if, if I'm one of those young players and I didn't, you know, I play with Champ Bailey, DeMarcus Ware, if I didn't see Champ Bailey or, or, or Sean Phillips or, or Peyton Manning do it, then it was like, why would I do it? Because he's 18 years Hall of Famer. I'm trying to be just like him right. in a sense. So Yeah. I think that's something that often gets lost with like wearable technology is that it has to be wearable. Like, and washable, I guess. Right. Yeah, was that, like <laughs> it has to just, it almost like the best version of it is something that you don't even think that you're wearing or using. You just use it and right. it has all this other stuff. That's great. Where are you at? Um, so one of the other things that are interesting to me with the, as a virtual reality application or, or um, even holographic is, um, you know, the, the mental side of sports has become so, so uh, you know, critical. It's a critical, just as critical as our training, as our nutrition, as our sleep. And, um, you know, some teams I know are investing in like, uh, like deprivation pods and, and all this interesting stuff to, um, um, you know, help kind of center themselves, help um, create the re better rehearse, vis visualize. <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's just another obvious application that probably is, is much closer now because, right, we, we're already kind of seeing some of that technology. Um, and, and you don't really need, um, you know, anything wearable or anything like that to kind of accomplish that. Well, I mean, I think the, in terms of virtual reality, augmented reality, it's not on the field on today. Right. I mean, we're not down to a contact lens. Right. This is a piece of equipment that's really, you know, you're wearing uh, around your eyes. And um, so we're seeing people re replay experiences, yeah. see them from different angles. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned people. Uh, Recreating a throwing motion is something we're seeing in uh, several places now. Uh, that's really the, you know, but it's, it's not so much the fan experience, I think, is the place where we're seeing the most innovation right now with augmented reality and, and visual reality. You know, there'd be, um, I don't think we're yet seeing the watching it live and bringing the stats into the stadium, but certainly at home, you know, seeing the game from different angles, recreating it. That's where the innovation in augmented virtual reality is. The, the specific use cases for people using it in training. Yeah. Right now, there's, uh, there are individuals that are pursuing it to try and uh, perfect their game. But I mean, we, we have a VR application that's used by a heap of teams, predominantly football, and there's a training application that sits across the top of that, as you were describing. And you know, some players swear by it and others yeah. don't love it. I mean, it's, I think it's, it's heavily down to individual tastes. I think it's one of those kind of emerging trends and time will tell whether it emerges as a trend or it's a, it's a passing fad. I think it will probably be a trend, but I think there's some tech work that's still- It's the mental done. game right now because yeah. you're not feeling it. Yeah. Uh, you're not feeling the ball in your hand or feeling the impact. Right, but it's still a much more powerful you know, I had to just use my brain to visualize, you know, to visualize yeah. my upcoming performance or to, you know, um, and, and so it's, it's going to make that process much easier, you know. Yeah. Uh, the ability yeah. for players to see plays that have, they haven't been part of those plays before and rather than just looking at a playbook or a video, from, they can see it from a perspective, you know, w w that they'd be standing in. Yeah. Like, that, that's, uh, that, that's strongly beneficial for players. Awesome. Um, I'm going to grab some questions that we have on the iPad, um, and which I think are coming in through Twitter. Um, so the first one I think is really interesting is like, if there was one piece of data that you guys could get um, from a point of view of like, either as an athlete or maybe like as helping athletes, what would that be? And, and, and I guess try and pick, pick something that you don't have or you didn't have. One, one piece of data as an yeah. athlete. So right. I would say, um, so I had a couple injuries in my career. Um, you know, I had two Tommy John elbow surgeries. Both of them were one pitch blowouts. I had, um, you know, uh, a quad blowout running to first after, you know, hitting this little dribbler off Roger Clemens and thinking I was going to get a base hit out of it. So I tried to run really hard and blew my leg. Um, no, no. Uh, <laughs> blew my calves a couple times, especially once I passed 30, 31, 32. As I heard to get into my mid 30s, I became you know, um, I would get these little naggy injuries every year. And um, I think there's, if I had access, in retrospect, I knew that my body was tight or maybe like I was, I was close to possibly being injured if I went too hard. 
And if I had actual data, whether it's like a patch that measured like my hydration levels or um, if I had um, you know, more workload data like CJ's talking about in terms of um, where my body was at and um, even more specifically, some of this compression gear now can actually measure um, um, which muscles are firing and maybe even the sequences that they're firing in. They can start measuring deficiencies if you're guarding. So if I had more information that could have let me know, uh, you know, let me know that I was in that red zone where I had to just kind of watch it, either take a step back, look for more recovery, mm -hmm. um, I think that could have helped me kind of avoid um, some injuries that I maybe pushed through some things. You want to answer next? You're more interesting than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we actually have that, so that's good for us. Yeah. Thank you for your uh, hard workship there to get what we need today. But um, ours, mine will be the recovery part. Um, our trainer, Steve Antonopoulos, I love Greek to death, but he's been with the Broncos for well over 50 plus years. And there's a lot of things that he does that are really old school way. It's probably a lot of trainers that you've been around the same way. They do a lot of things the old school way. Um, you know, I tore my meniscus last season, um, you know, had surgery. You know, this season had a good year and everything, you know, worked out well. But might as well be more on the certain injury that you have, what rehab, you know, how, how many times you should do it, how hard you should go, oh, yeah. you know, what's the best efficient way to get you back and healthy, because even when I felt, you know, when I was told and I felt like I was healthy, ready to go, I still had some nagging injuries with my right knee. Now they're gone now, mm -hmm. um, you know, and they'll just tell you, um, and you as a competitor, you want to be out there, but they'll just tell you, hey man, eventually that will go away, this will go away, this is why, I wish I, we had the data that, that makes me understand why I'm having that little nag and what, you know, rehab and what, what um, things that I can do, recovery products that I can use, um, to make that go away completely or make it just that much better when I step back on the football field. I mean, I take the opposite extreme to this. I agree with all of this, and the opposite extreme is, um, so I'd love to have more, the integration of more self-reported data from athletes, especially things like how they're feeling and mood and those types of things, because, you know, performance, it's mind and body, and we can gather lots of information about body performance, and I think the next, the next opportunity is to start integrating some more of that other data, and not in kind of a, a scary type of invasive way, but just understanding how much of this performance is being driven by things like sleep is a known quantity. We know that that impacts performance, but just general mood. And, you know, there's been a movement towards mindfulness and, and this type of thing kind of recently in the West. You know, there's no doubt that um, state of mind and mood is a, it has a dramatic um, modulating effect on performance. So I'd like more of that data integrated. I was thinking about it from the perspective of how can we go recreate that, that football game, put somebody in there. One thing we don't have, we have all the video, we can see what's happening, mm -hmm. but we don't hear what you're, uh, I'm not saying, I, I, I don't stop. think you want to. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think it's an interesting thing. Like, I think, uh, 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 you're a bit of a, I think it, again, Terrell Suggs it, is not it, a nice guy. It crosses that <laughs> privacy line, but I think it would really create a level of authenticity in the experience that's, because one of the challenges is, when you're, you know, when you're at the game, it's so social and there's so much energy, but you don't lack data. So one of the questions is how do we bring more data to people in the game? And that's where holograms and augmented reality can really play a role for the fans at the game. But at yeah. home, it is less social than being at the game. Yeah. And so how does, how can the fan experience at home become more social? And there's a whole bunch of different elements to that. But when we try and immerse people in it, uh, we could certainly make the television louder and you know, noisier, but actually, the fact that we can't hear this fellow being not a nice guy, man, that would be, that'd be kind of fun. I mean, that'd be kind of interesting. Or yeah, or you'd hear sometimes, um, at, at, you know, in a packed stadium, sometimes there's just this din, and you don't even really hear much of an in, much individual noise except what's right around you on the field. Yeah, but, and right now yeah. we have nothing. Really. Yeah, yeah, that would be cool. Nothing like that. It can be seventy thousand people. When I grab the ball, I don't hear nothing, and yeah. then when I get tackled, I hear everything. Yeah. It's, it's weird, but that's I, I, I knew I was in trouble when I was out there pitching, and I heard that one guy just tell me I was terrible, you know? And, and, and I, I was like, oh, you gotta, you, know, you, gotta, you gotta bring it back here, yeah. Uh, I, was, I was wondering, like, third down, you know, when the, the, t like the, the fans are trying to make noise to put off the uh, opponents, like, does it, does it, are we really making enough noise? I think like, <laughs> we're so locked in, um, and what we're, what's going on, literally, you know, I think Kansas City, Seattle's big too, but Kansas City is probably one of the toughest places to play. No, Seattle's loud. 
Okay, he's a Seattle fan. He <laughs> told me. <laughs> but um, now nah, I've I've had can't now I know from communication. You know, Peyton's right next to me and telling me what, <laughs> and I can't hear him. But as soon as I hear the play, and I, I take you know, I look around and, and see my keys and things of that nature. Um, I'm so locked in. Everything else around me is irrelevant. Yeah. You know, my job is I'm focused on the job at hand, and you know, I don't hear nothing until I go, oh. Plays over and man, they're really loud in here. Yeah, <laughs> and that goes back to the kicker, right? The, yeah, who, who like who can just, just saw everything mm -hmm. just went like That's that. Right. Yeah. Any sign, yeah. Um, and one quick final question. You you talked a little bit about you know like taking data back to um to like like high school and stuff like that to try and evaluate players. Um, we're we're moving into this point where we can actually like you know sequence people's DNA. Like how how deep is it okay to go in terms of like telling people like to play this sport or to play that sport or to, you know? It, it's, it'll be tough. Um, you know, kids these days, they, they idol certain players and they believe they can be that player on this scale. Um, you know, if, if someone would have said, hey, CJ, you'll be a better NASCAR driver than you're a football player, then <laughs> I definitely would have been like, well, you better put me in the car and, you know, make it figure it out. Um, but I just think it, it will help the kid, instead of trying to tell him what sport he can play, it will help the kid in the sport he's in. You know, this is something that you want to do, mm -hmm. then, then let's give you the information and the data to, to make you become the best. And I think it makes the, the playing field fair. You know, you have, you, you make assumption that high school phenom, because he played, you know, he found a way to play in the MLB. High school phenom, I found a way to play in the National Football League. And sometimes it's not the case for everybody. But at least, you know, whether I was a three-star recruit, who knows if he was a three-star recruit, four-star, five-star, maybe it makes the playing field fair as in, you know, that super athletic, you know, I know a lot of people who are way more athletic than myself, that super athletic talent that he has, um, but if I had information and data to, to bring me up to that same level, um, maybe I could have, you know, I mean, I went to Cal, but maybe I could have went to like Alabama. That, that, that's coming. <laughs> so, so it's so it's going to be, I think, a lot easier very soon. There's already apps in development where parents can, um, you know, kind of, you can collect data on these kids, right? And they go in a database. It's going to make recruiting better. It's going to, just what you said, it's going to help um, teams find find these, uh, these gems. The flip side yeah. is like, if we're seeing Gattaca or Red Brave New World, like, right. we don't want to go there, right? <laughs> <laughs> we leave that to fiction. Yeah. So, well, you know, it's one awesome. of my favorite movies, though. Yeah, great like, movie. Yeah. I don't want to go in the furnace, so. Uh, exactly. Well, unfortunately, I think we've, uh, we've run out of time, but I want to thank you guys for that really interesting conversation. Thank you.